Hello and welcome to What Would Jane Do? And today Kate and I are going to look at what would Jane do about our current trend in people going to book clubs. Now before we started recording this we were just chatting about our experience of book clubs and we've got quite different experiences of this. So Kate, first of all, what's your where do you hang out and discuss books? Well, I'm afraid I, I hang out far too much on social media. Um, so of that, because my interest is books, uh, I have various uh, authors I follow uh, and various uh, people who follow those authors talk about the books naturally enough. Um, so there's at least three I can think of, including the Jane Austen fan club, of course, uh, who have a reading session every month. Every month they read a chapter or through the chapters uh, during that month of a particular Jane Austen book. Um, you know, lots of interesting comments come up about that. And, and I often get recommendations for other books. So somebody says, oh, this is terrible. I finished my favorite author. Who is like that author that you could recommend? Uh, so, so we get recommended books that way. And uh, we, I think we mentioned before, we often uh, not fight, but vigorously defend our choice for which movie star would re best represent our, our fictional hero and heroine and things like that. So it's, it is quite amusing. We must put um, the name of the Jane Austen. Well, it is just the Jane Austen fan club on okay. Facebook. Yes. Isn't there it? are many. There are many. Yeah. <laughs> this is so, a very good one. Yeah. Uh, I actually do one in person in, in modern parlance, which means we meet <laughs> together and uh, we, we, meet, <laughs> <laughs> we meet four times a year. Mm -hmm. um, this book club has been going for a very long time. I It sort of travels with me. Um, in the sense, I, it started off in when I was working in Poland and then it came to Oxford where I've been living since 95, so mm -hmm. a long time. Uh, and as three of us have been in it pretty much all the way along, um, but we're fairly stable. People have been in it for years and mm -hmm. there's a lot of suggestions of books saying, oh, shall we do such and such? Didn't we do her 10 years ago? A lot of that. <laughs> um, but we have a meal and some wine and the rule is we start discussing the book over pudding or desserts <laughs> and so there's a lot of gossip beforehand and then <laughs> then the sort of over coffee we set up the next book and the next meeting so that's my book club so let's think about the equivalent in Jane Austen's day and the sort of reading culture of her era um, we assume that wine drinking gossip and chat still happened there oh, absolutely. Uh, and, yeah. and we know that quite a lot of people think of Jane Austen has a sort of happy relationship with book clubs not least because of the the book that then became the film the the Jane Austen book club <laughs> where the people there like you um, read her books and it's part of changing their lives we're going to turn the tables and think about Jane Austen coming to a book club rather than being the subject of it I don't know because you have the perspective of being an author now how cringe making is it for you if people are if it's your book under discussion do you approach those with some trepidation do people are people quite critical of you if, if you do that or are you, are you expecting people to be reasonably well mannered about it i would hate to be present <laughs> where i was discussed um you obviously do get a bit of that when you do like school for me school visits for my younger books or um, <laughs> festivals or public yes. events for my older books for adults and but a book know, club is quite an intimate atmosphere the expectation is, yeah. is you're going to dissect that book and possibly not be too kind about it possibly but i i think obviously having the author there ought to act as a, a restraint but not necessarily some people almost like taking authors down a peg or two or showing their far superior knowledge like Lady Catherine de Burr or something like that. What do you think? What have you encountered? Have you encountered any awkwardness or is it generally favourable? Uh, I think the dynamic changes with the author in the room. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's actually better for the author to be outside the room. You know? Yeah, I, I, would, I would definitely agree because there's bound to be either somebody, uh, I don't know, possibly wanting to fan girl all over you <laughs> and say all oh, those things in sliced bread oh and your book changed my life and uh, i've read everything you've ever written and what about that chapter and let's talk about something you've completely forgotten you've ever written um or you've got somebody 
wanting to say, oh, no, I'm not affected by this at all and almost go the opposite direction. I have had the person who thinks they know more than me. <laughs> Definitely, yeah. Anyway, so let's just think about um, publishing yeah. in the late 18th century oh. um, to the early 19th century, Jane Austen's lifetime. So what is your understanding of where Jane would have found things to read? Well, I, I had a little think about this and I did, amazingly, a little bit of research because I was thinking, okay, when did when would book clubs start? Obviously, the, the book has been around a long time. Um, and uh, with, with Jane Austen, you've just got the start of Industrial Revolution and generally uh, uh, better printing, less expensive book publishing. So uh, it was interesting that uh, book circulating libraries, as we understand them today, um, started out of uh, a need for uh, booksellers to make a bit more money let's face it. Um, so they would be selling to a small number of people who were wealthy enough to buy books, especially in, in the early days. And I think it was about 1740s, um, the first emergence of circulating libraries um, came about. But I found an even earlier reference to an actual book club, would you believe? Oh. Um, uh, how early do you think it might have been? A book club, mm -hmm. Ma male or female? Female. Oh, oh really exciting. Um, <laughs> I'm going to go for 1720. Okay, that's a good guess. Now I'm trying to find the, the reference now because I wrote it down specially. Um, it was actually, the one I found was, uh, I think 16, no, where was it? 1640, I think. It was a, it was a, a group of ladies. There we are, 1634. 1634. Oh. And it was actually recorded because they were traveling to um the new world uh america uh headed to a massachusetts bay colony and anne hutchinson organized a woman's group on board the ship uh to examine weekly sermons it was very improving um uh, i'm sure that there may well have been gossip uh included in that but it was it was ostensibly at least very improving and and moral but i was highly amused um that i think we found out about this book club because when they landed uh the General Assembly condemned the group. How can you oh. condemn a, a woman's group reading sermons? I mean, for goodness sake. <laughs> well, you know, it's women ha having a thought or any Women having a thought and discussing the thought amongst themselves. Yeah. Very, very dangerous. Can't be having that. <laughs> well, well done, well done, Anne Hutchinson and co. Uh, yeah. And obviously, if people find out about even earlier book clubs mm. than that, let us know. Uh, <laughs> you know email me. I'm, I'm or, or find me on social media I, I want to know um so I also have you know as an author I've taken interest in the whole sort of structure of the industry and how it worked yes um it they didn't have the sort of royalty situation that we have now so if I publish a book now yeah. I get a little bit of tiny little fraction of what's what's sold is <laughs> the author gets really very little it's yeah. something like uh seven percent something like that um but in those days you would sell a manuscript to a publisher for a sort of lump sum yes i think didn't jane sell her first mm. novel for 10 pounds and then the the devil uh, the, sorry the, the gentleman who had the the book did not publish it um, maybe didn't think it was had a wide enough readership yet or was sat, sat on it basically and she was so annoyed at this i think she wrote under a pseudonym to buy it back well, well to, to say can you please publish this can you give it back <laughs> and he said yes certainly if you pay me back the 10 pounds and of course she couldn't afford that that was a, a year's wage or something that, that she just didn't have um but it did obviously get published eventually which was good news for everybody but yes she was Pretty much her novel was held hostage for a long time, which is a bit of a shame. Yes, yeah, so it's a very different, uh, the structure is different. Though there was mm. one way of getting published, um, which is very similar to the sort of cutting edge of today's, and that is the crowdfunded. Yes. Book. And Jane Austen's name appears on a list of the subscribers to Fanny Burney's novel, Camilla. It's a, a doorstop of a book. Um, I it have is. a copy here, and I'll show you it. <laughs> Um, you get your money's worth you with um, do. Fanny Burney. Sorry, I'll just bring it into it. There we go. <laughs> um, and 
Fanny Burney was one of Jane Austen's favourite writers and she's actually putting her money where her reading eyes are <laughs> uh, and helping fund the next book by Fanny Burney. Uh -huh. um, so along with other relatives of hers. So that's, that's another kind of book club. It's a group of people who like an author, but majority are women who are getting together and saying, yes, we're going to fund your book. So that's yes, another thing. It's a great yeah. idea, isn't it? And, and it was very difficult um, to get that initial uh, publication, that initial recognition. Uh, and Jane Austen uh, must have been very difficult for her because she was told all her life, oh, you're wonderful, you're witty. You know, her family definitely encouraged her and her friends, I'm sure, certainly did uh, when, they, when they read her works. Um, and, then, and then to have somebody basically turn around and say, no, you're not good enough or we don't think this will sell. Um, it's very hard for any author, I'm sure, to have that. Yes, rejection is part and parcel of, yeah. if anyone's out there is thinking of a career in writing, <laughs> do not go into writing if you cannot take rejection. Yeah. You have to learn not to take it personally. That's no, absolutely I can say. not. Mm. And, and the, the, you know, the, the publication world is full of all sorts of books, including Harry Potter, that, that uh, languished for ages or got turned down numerous times. And then you just need that one proofreader or... or, or, or uh, you know, ed editor that, that recognizes your genius uh, and, and thinks that you've got something. And, and so just, just keep sending them out there is, is definitely what I would say. And I, I myself, strangely enough, uh, uh, write simply for pleasure. I don't write to, to get published. I, I just simply be, do it as a creative process. Um, uh, and I imagine Jane Austen would be very similar, especially as she didn't get published until far, far later. And you just write because it gives you pleasure yeah, Possibly because it amuses your friends and family, but it's a it's a creative thing. I, I just get a feeling sometimes I, I need to write something down. I need I need to just get it out. <laughs> or I, I will, like you, I, I I have an idea and I think, oh yes, I can write a few paragraphs about that. And it's just almost like it bubbles up inside you, and you have to get it out somehow. And and Jane Austen, um, I, I myself do things like drawing and stuff, but I don't. I hate showing those drawings to anybody until they're finished because they're not finished yet. So I don't. I would hate somebody standing over my shoulder watching me write or or, or watching me draw. Um, so it's quite interesting. And I know at book clubs, um, often they encourage people to read snippets out loud, maybe things that you've written or poetry or things like that. Um, and certainly, the Regency world was full of uh, people who enjoyed um, all sorts of word games, puns, acrostics, um, uh, quizzes, and things like that, and and just playing with language. Um, the Baroness Auxie men mentions the Scarlet Pimpernel uh, playfully making up rhymes in front of the Prince Regent, uh, you know, as a fashionable thing to do. Um, so it was very much uh, a society that loved language, uh, enjoyed playing with language, uh, and was absolutely ripe for reading and novels uh, and, and entertainment in that fashion. And uh, interestingly, um, there were two stratas, if you like, of uh, uh, reading clubs. Uh, one was the subscription uh, uh, readership, and this would usually be very worthy, well, not very worthy, very rich, probably, uh, gentlemen like, you know, the Duke of Devonshire and his circle or something like that. And they would fund uh, the purchase of a library or a collection of books. And it might be, it's usually a very worthy subject like science, religion, theology, travel, history. Uh, and, and you would build up a collection of the, the books and discuss them amongst yourselves. Um, but that would, would definitely be um, probably quite expensive, definitely not for public consumption. It's for your own select little circle uh, to show how erudite and, and worthy you are and to do, you know, debate the important topics of the day versus circulatory libraries, um, which I, I think, as, as I mentioned, probably started off about 1740s, spurred on by booksellers saying, OK, I'm selling books, but surely I could be making more money than this. So the basic premise is genius. It, it was the Netflix of its day. You pay a small subscription instead of buying a very expensive book with possibly money you don't have and also you, no, no space for a library. Um, and you can, buy, you can basically read a load of books uh, and share them amongst your friends, possibly. And it's not just books. It's magazines. It's pamphlets. It's um, f probably fashion magazines and, and circulars. So you had a whole world of books at your disposal without having to purchase what was a very expensive purchase at the time. And so they were definitely seen as more common. I don't, I don't know necessarily that, that your average working person would have belonged to them, but certainly your, um, your middle class 
uh, as well as uh, um, upper class as well, uh, because it was just a far more affordable, enjoyable way of, of sharing literature. So I think Jane, in a sense, had um, access to both because her mm. father had a smaller version of the gentleman's library where she would have had more, you know, sort of they would have been the theology and the, yes. the sermons and so on in there. Yes. Uh, he did love plays and other mm. sorts of entertainment, things like the novels of Henry Fielding and the other male no novelists of that era. But she also would have had access to the, well, the, the blockbusters of its era, as you were <laughs> saying, the, of course, the wonderful Gothic tales of uh, quite often female writers, the Anne Radcliffe's uh, of yes, her era. Yes, a wonderful period for a whole burgeoning load of uh, female authors um, to just let rip and, and, and uh, thrill the imaginations of the day uh, with what I would describe as Gothic soap operas. Um, they're, they're, it was an interesting time because before then, I think uh, a lot of books, uh, because of the expense of publishing, apart from anything else, were probably quite worthy, even children's books as such, like I'm thinking of Struhl Peter from Germany, where it's a very moralistic and a, a, a horrible tale of a poor boy that gets his fingers cut off basically because of biting his nails. So it wasn't it wasn't exactly it was, your books were supposed to be moral and improving and probably um, quite quite boring as 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 a result. It was they weren't necessarily written by um, what I would describe as as good authors who were really intent on capturing their their audience. They were written by people who probably had enough money to fund publication of their worthy. Um, uh, you know, history of Rome in, in 58 volumes or the history of the potato or something like that. Um, and you would have it on your shelves, um, but you wouldn't necessarily read it. You'd have it to show how, uh, you know, worthy worthy and, and well-educated you were. And, and it was interesting. I came across a quote by the poet Robert Southey, who was a contemporary of Jane Austen's. And he said uh, about circulating li libraries and also private purchase of books. Uh, it says, those who buy books do not read them and those who read them do not buy them. <laughs> so that sort of gives you an idea. Yeah, Robert Southey was the origin of Goldilocks and the Three Bears. Yes, wonderful. Thank there you, Sally. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, yes, that's, he was in my doctorate. So there you oh, go. A little specialist go. subject on Robert Southey for you. I didn't put that you. in there just knowing that. So oh, that's absolutely. <laughs> my meld, Kate, my meld. So... <laughs> There, we've touched on the fact there was a sort of male and a female division within reading at the time. And Jane Austen is incredibly interesting on this because mm. she actually subverts it and challenges it. And you were saying before this that you wanted to read a little bit by Henry Tilney in Northanger Abbey, where this exact subject is discussed. <laughs> so, would you like, let's all, are we all sitting comfortably? I hope so. Because uh, Kate's going to read us. A bedtime Remember, story. Northanger Abbey is the <laughs> very early novel by Jane Austen, but it, though it came out later, it was her sort of first. And um, the scene setting here is that Catherine Morland, who's the ingenue, the young girl who's gone to Bath for her first sort of season, um, has found friendship with a sensible brother and sister, Henry and um, is it Isabel? No. Oh, no, no, she's with the Crofts. Is it, is it, no, no, she's not with the cross. She's 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 with her benefactress anyway, and her rich husband. Yes, uh, and she's there as a companion uh, yes. to, to a friend of the family. And so she she rather falls for Henry Tilney, who's this? Um, Who wouldn't? Who? What? He understands muslin, Julia. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> anyway, they have a discussion about um, novels. So, yes. on a walk. On a walk. Well, in fact, uh, yes, on, on a walk and possibly driving uh, on the way to Northanger Abbey. That's this uh, gothic thing that has built up in Catherine's imagination as the most exciting place she could possibly go, having read a lot of gothic novels. Um, so I think I think uh, he was saying something along the lines of, have you, have you heard about the Abbey? And she said, to be sure I have. Is it not a fine old place, just like what one reads about? And he, and he sort of starts uh, taking the mick out of her and say, and are you prepared to encounter all the horrors that a building such as what one reads about may produce? Have you a stout heart, nerves fit for sliding panels and tapestry? Oh, Catherine said, oh, 
I, I do not think I should be so easily frightened, because there would be so many people in the house, and besides, it has never been uninhabited and left deserted for years, and then the family comes back unawares, without giving any notice, as generally happens. No, certainly. We shall not have to explore our way in a hall dimly lighted by the expiring embers of a wood fire, nor be obliged to spread our beds on the floor of a room without windows, doors or furniture. But you must be aware that when a young lady is, by whatever means, introduced to a dwelling of this kind, she is always lodged apart from the rest of the family. While they snugly repair to their own end of the house, she is formally conducted by Dorothy, the ancient housekeeper, up a different staircase and along many gloomy passages into an apartment never used since some cousin or kin died in it about 20 years before. Can you stand such a ceremony as this? Will you not your mind misgive you when you find yourself in the gloomy chamber too lofty and extensive for you with only the feeble rays of a single lamp to take in its size, its walls hung with tapestry exhibiting figures as large as life and the bed? of dark green stuff or purple velvet, presenting you a funeral appearance. Will you not your heart sink within you? Oh, but this will not happen to me, I'm sure. <laughs> and I love that. Um, I love it for several reasons. One is Henry Tilney is obviously uh, encouraging Catherine uh, in, in her, her love of Gothic novels and, and basically sharing a joke with her, uh, sort of building on the, the typical Gothic fantasies of the time and, and, and comparing it to, to uh, real life. And Jane Austen herself is encouraging the reader at the same time to have a laugh at, the, at, at all the Gothic tropes. And, 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 uh, um, and Catherine, I think, is, is half um, suspicious that he's taking the making out of her and, and half enjoying the fact that he knows all the things she likes. So it's a, it's a meeting of minds. Uh, it's showing how compatible they are for each other as, as well. So on several levels, and it's also a, an overarching theme of the book, isn't it? Fantasy versus real life uh, and Catherine's sometimes inability to tell the difference. <laughs> so it's, it's giving, giving yeah. the reader the whole theme of the book, really. And Henry, earlier on, it does a very stout defence of the novel. He's oh. mocking what he loves. Yes, or exactly. Teasing, I think. Teasing. He's teasing, yes. He's not That's doing it at not. all in a cruel way or, or making her feel... Um, less for for liking novels he's saying no I, I love novels myself and they're great they're a great fun so the particular book that he is well it's the Anne Radcliffe style mm. and just so you know that's that's Henry's very accurate depiction of it but I thought it would be quite fun to slip in here just a little bit of Anne Radcliffe herself from the mysteries of Rodolfo which is mentioned again and again in yes. Jane Austen's work um but not that many people read it, except sort of people go to university and are given a, a seminar on the Gothic. Um, I so think I, I mentioned before, I found it quite hard going because there was a lot of description in there. There's a lot of words. And also <laughs> the, the hero and heroine for my modern sensibilities were quite annoying. But uh, for a, a slice of the time and a slice of what people did find thrilling and worth a while, and the fact that it is such a tome of a book tells you these people who were able to read it had tons of time on their hands and really the time to really immerse themselves in these stories which is which is was quite interesting and, and you just get into the style of it and you just it just transport you and carry you away into this fantasy world so have here's a little bit of uh <laughs> emily going on the the to find out what's happened to her aunt right Far away. so it, it's very much what henry's been talking about the image of her aunt murdered, murdered perhaps by the hand of Montoni, rose into her mind. She trembled, gasped for breath, repented that she had dared to venture hither and checked her steps. But after she had paused a few minutes, the consciousness of her duty returned and she went on. Still all was silent. At length, a track of blood upon a stair caught her eye and instantly she perceived that the wall and several other steps were stained. She paused, again struggled to support herself and the lamp almost fell from her trembling hand. Still no sound was heard 
No living beings seemed to inhabit the turret. A thousand times she wished herself again in her chamber, dreaded to inquire farther, dreaded to encounter some horrible spectacle, and yet could not resolve, now that she was so near the termination of her efforts, to desist from them. Having again collected courage to proceed, after ascending about halfway up the turret, she came to another door, and here again she stopped in hesitation. <laughs> and on and on it goes. I've read you like the first third of a paragraph of this poor heroine it's trembling, wonderful. pausing. It's one of the amount of time she pauses and thinks, Shall I go on? Oh, uh, all right then. <laughs> she pauses for, for minutes. The minute is a long time. Like, for goodness really... sake, find the horror already. <laughs> but. I think that this is the kind of thing which I could imagine in the Austin household they would oh, yes. read with huge enjoyment yes. and laughter. You and you and I in, you know. enjoy reading those passages, and and you can put the voices on, and you can, you know, convey the shudder of horror, and just the melodrama of it all is great yeah. fun. Absolutely. So that's one kind of book that might have appeared <laughs> in the Jane Austen book club um, back then. And just to sort of point out where else you find it referenced in her works. I mean, we there's a lot, a lot, a lot in Northanger Abbey. But, of course, it also pops up in Emma when yes. she's another comic moment where Harriet Smith, poor old Harriet, Aww. is persuading her farmer lover. Um, <laughs> is it Robert Martin? Robert Martin, yeah, and she, he's been reading like the Agricultural Register and what have you. And she's saying, "You must, you must read Anne Radcliffe, Robert." <laughs> <laughs> These poor guys, probably very down to earth farmer. Maybe he need, he would like a bit of escapism. We, we never really find out, do we? I'm sure um, he goes away and reads it because I'm he's, sure he's, he does. Bless him. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, um, she's using it as a gauge of both the uh, sort of she's affectionate toward Harriet, I think, and right. it's this sort of there's a it's layers of jokes here if you understand what. It is she is recommending but also um, if you know any farmers and I, I happen to know at least one um they have no time to read books that they, they literally have no time to read letters uh, they have 10 minutes here and there in their very very busy days so actually would she would have been asking to for quite a feat to read a whole two, <laughs> three volume novel <laughs> so anyway it's used there as a little gauge of um the, the characters hmm. But we, another kind of reading which is mentioned, of course, is um, Mr. Collins when he reads aloud to <laughs> the girls because they got a bit fed up with him. Someone says, well, please make him read something. And, of course, he's yeah. sitting there reading is Dear Old Four yeah. <laughs> yeah. I actually did read these. I was, when did I was, you? And what yeah. was your impression of them? Were they very improving? Was your life changed? I, well, obviously, I'm a, I'm, that's why I'm so perfectly behaved. <laughs> 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 no, they're what you think. They're not... Mm -hmm. They're not, they're not, not as bad as Mr. Collins. <laughs> but they're, they're obviously trying to, to to tell people what to do, which is you yes. know, which is, you know, thing. a worthy endeavour. Yeah, but <laughs> yes, I, I I don't think they're much fun. Um, <laughs> but maybe the lady you mentioned, uh, what was her name, Anne Hutchinson, or the, the ladies on the boat to yes, America. The ladies on the boat. Uh, they would probably love four dice. He's got his. Everybody has their market. They um, do. Yes, absolutely. I'm not, I'm not here to, to um, yes, so, so Anne Hutchinson, that was it. Um, and yes, if you're stuck on a boat, particularly if you're on a long journey, you, there's not a lot for you to do. You've got to read absolutely everything. Even uh, four going, dice is good. Even four <laughs> dice, is, probably twice. Um, so, <laughs> so yes, you, you will need any entertainment. And, and it's just uh, a good excuse, as are most book clubs, uh, to socialise, to get together, to discuss the uh, things that you that interest you and i think particularly that's what you find in jane austen uh book clubs or or, or jane austen fan clubs um people who have had this uh enjoyment of a private reading of a story and and are really taken by a story can find can meet similar minds and book reading is normally seen as a very solitary exercise and i know i particularly don't belong to many physical book clubs because I just like reading on my own. <laughs> well, you see, I think that, that's a very modern <laughs> sensibility. It wasn't solitary um, in no, the days yeah. where you all sat around in the evening. Yes. Um, so another thing the Jane Austen family would have read and reads very well aloud, of course, mm. is Dr. Johnson, another of her yes. great style guides. And 
I, I thought I'd bring him in because um, not all of the masculine voices are, should be excluded from this. No, this not at all. Not at all. Um, and I, I thought I'd choose a little bit from the Rambler, an essay he did on the rules of writing, because this is the kind of thing that Jane Austen would uh, would be reading and admiring. Hmm. And I thought it also might have a potential message for today. Oh, so right, bear with on, me, and you might find out. You might be able to find some application. <laughs> Every government, say the politicians, is perpetually degenerating towards corruption, <laughs> from which it must be rescued at certain periods by the resuscitation of its first principles and the re-establishment of its original constitution. Every animal body, according to the methodic physicians, is by the predominance of some exuberant quality continually declining towards disease and death which must be obviated by a seasonal reduction of the peccant humours to just equipoise, which health requires. And he goes on to compare that to writing. It was just by chance I picked up that one about <laughs> corruption in government. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, the Johnsonian it's lovely stuff. how historically the more things change, the more they say the, the same. <laughs> so you can draw many historical parallels from previous. It's whether you learn from them is another matter. <laughs> the Johnson style is long sentences, but often balanced. Hmm. You do get echoes of it in Jane Austen. Hmm. Um, and very sort of uh, measured tones. Hmm. Uh, and, and so he's definitely someone who everybody in the 18th century had sort of worked into their writing DNA. It was like a sort of... Um, Blue, you know, when you look at the architecture of yes. that era, yes. he writes like that. <clears throat> that <laughs> but everybody had the time or was expected to spend the time um, to read more and, and, and to consider more and, and to discuss uh, intellectual pursuits were very, were very much admired and encouraged um, with men and women. And the circulatory libraries particularly uh, encouraged men and women to meet, to discuss, uh, to talk about the ideas of the day. And interestingly as well, they weren't, they were certainly not the hushed public libraries that we uh, consider today. They were meeting places, they were gathering places. They wouldn't just sell books or, or sell um, uh, uh, the loan of books. Um, they, they could sell anything from hats, tobacco, tea. You might have a billiard room in there. Uh, you might have food and drink, certainly. So there were definitely places to socialise, see and be seen, and discuss ideas of the day. So they were they were very convivial and, and were generally at uh, fashionable watering holes like Bath uh, and, and Brighton, no doubt, uh, not just London, um, but in very, quite small towns as well. And at its height, at the most popular uh, time of the circulating libraries, there were about a thousand just in England alone. So that shows you how popular and how good a business um, they were doing, I think. Uh, one chap who started one ran it for 30 years. So it was obviously very, very popular and, and just opened up reading. So the two things that would have benefited Jane Austen from her novels being part of a circulating library would be a much wider audience than just buying the book alone might have uh, gained her. Uh, so much better um, notice so that when she had another book for publication, they thought, oh, that did really well. Um, you know, and people were asking for it at the circulating library. So um, that that would help us out, uh, and and just um, yes, it would would have made her uh, much much better known, really. And the other thing that, of course, was available not just novels was poetry, mm. and um, Jane's favourite poet was called Cooper. It's spelled Cowper, just in case you're confused. <laughs> it. Um, I thought I'd just bring a little bit of him into the conversation because. In the Emma Thompson Sense and Sensibility film, there's a hilarious scene where poor old <laughs> Edward Ferris Bravo. is being asked by Marianne <laughs> to read, and he's not reading well enough. Oh, bless him. Um, well, what, yeah, so it was like, it was, uh, like me when uh, some, somebody read out the Henry Tilney uh, paragraph we, we were talking about earlier, and, and uh, the, the poor person was struggling uh, with the language. Uh, and, and, and it was painful to me, and I, I was very Marianne in that moment. Yes, for goodness sake, give me the book. I'll read it. <laughs> Look, just so you can find it if you want to follow it up, everybody. The, <laughs> the poem that um, is in that film is called The Castaway by Cooper, mm. and it starts, 
obscurest night involved the sky, the Atlantic billows roared, when such a destined wretch as I washed headlong from on board. And, so on. <laughs> and it's actually the last, the last <laughs> verse which Marianne really gets angry over <laughs> in the film. No voice divine the storm allayed, no light propitious shone, when snatched from all effectual end. Aid, we perished, perished. alone. <laughs> yeah, he doesn't do a very good. I did a terrible job just then. But um, you can see that a lot of uh, poetry was also shared in family circles, in reading circles, yeah. as, as a performance, as a joint thing. Um, so that's another area. And then the final area, which we won't read an extract from, is <laughs> because Shakespeare was popular. It, often rewritten um in the <laughs> things happy endings yes, yes um but basically we know shakespeare so these kind of things would also be read out aloud dryden and, should, and let's not forget should be read out aloud they are plays they are meant to yes. be read and, and yes. the whole rhythms and tones of voice and drama if you read it on the page i'm very lucky in that i'm, I'm a person that uh, can visualize things very easily and hear things in my head very easily but it's completely flat com Compared to reading it out aloud it's it's supposed to be a living <laughs> living thing yeah. and of course um again in jane austen in mansfield park we get them regressing <laughs> from a reading now, circle to an acting now. circle so we're not allowed to talk about that because uh, that's a bit different an acting circle All but right. um so there we are we, we've covered male writers female writers um we've covered the gothic uh, we've covered some poetry and some plays. <laughs> so let's think about moving away from the 18th century book circle where it was widely shared and a great topic of conversation where people will be au courant with what was just come out, <laughs> that kind of thing. And imagine her coming to a book circle today. <laughs> but let's bring her along with some of her characters. Ooh. Now, I personally think that Jane Austen would fit right in with my book circle uh, <laughs> we'd love to have her there she i think she'd have you know a lot to say we're just reading a patricia highsmith this week so you know we could see what she thinks of the kind of psychological uh, mysteries i think <laughs> she'd have a lot to say but anyway um giggling and drinking wine yeah i could see her doing that well, we, we know Jane Austen was very sociable. We know she went yeah. to halls and assemblies and, and loved fashion and uh, had lots of jokes with her, her family circle. Um, but I think it would be, yes, I think it would be interesting um, to put her amongst strangers, whether she would hang back maybe and observe a book club, uh, not putting herself forward too much so that she could sort of lurk in the shadows and observe various characteristics, or whether she would be the life and soul and happily critiquing uh, whichever author there was at, at, at the time. It's quite interesting. Maybe she'd do a bit of both. Yes, and I did want to ask you if you thought that she would feel happier in a mixed book club like my own, with male and, male, men and women. Yes, I don't, I don't see why not. I think she obviously enjoyed, um, well, her particular friends when, when she was at balls, and I think she would enjoy the spark... Uh, that does come between men and women um, having a, a, a debate, uh, particularly about things that affect the, the various sexes. So I, I think she wouldn't have uh, any problems with that. I think she'd probably find that quite stimulating. I mean, her characters obviously show model that behaviour. We've already no. mentioned Henry Tilney several times. He's talking books with Catherine. So, yes, that's clearly a thing he does. Oh. Uh, but we also get Mr. Darcy in his rather clumsy way trying to compliment Lizzie. Um, <laughs> sense of reading. And yes, her mind. that's right. It rather misfires his compliment, but you can see <laughs> what he's trying to do um, there, which is to encourage her reading and discussion of books. So I think that Jane Austen would approve of mixed groups. I would just say at this point, though, that it'd be quite funny to find out if there is a real difference between a single sex book group or not. I've, anecdotally, I think there is. So a friend of mine, <laughs> um, she belonged to one which was, you know, very relaxed and they all sort of, you know, lots of wine and chat. Um, whereas her husband belongs to one where they meticulously ranked each book. <laughs> At the end, they would they've got like a like a league table and they always yeah. put in where it came. Um, 
and they were sort of like the, the overall winner, and then they were ranked. A bit like football all, scores, perchance. It's like football scores. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking. <laughs> but do you so, think do you think um, that's part of the male psyche to not necessarily talk about emotions and feelings as much because they're not encouraged to in today's society, certainly, um, and to concentrate more on things like collecting, sorting, analysing. Um, uh, things like that logic uh, and, and and women to veer well of course I'm sure at a lot of book clubs and talk about just about anything and everything uh, but in great detail you know and possibly childbirth and and who they're seeing at the moment and who who's having an affair with who and, <laughs> and I'm definitely all about feelings if nothing yeah, else yeah it certainly works as a caricature but I don't yes, know it is it I is. don't know I'm, I mean I'm, I'm making mm, definite sweeping generalizations yeah I, it's probably Anyway, I, I think this will be up to the listener. Re dear reader, yes. you decide. <laughs> what have you discovered in your book club? Is it a, a hotbed of intrigue or are you strictly analytical? Or a bit yeah, of that's right. That's So, yeah, you can write in and tell us. <laughs> okay, so let's think of, the, uh, sort of our final gallop around this uh, subject is let's think which of her characters would fit in well. I think you've got some thoughts on this. I do. I had, I had a little think about this. And I thought Mr. Collins uh, would yeah. definitely not be your favourite book club uh, attendee, although he might enjoy himself immensely um, reading some improving tome, no doubt recommended to him by Lady Catherine. And he's read it extensively and is willing to go on for ages about it. And Lady Catherine herself has probably heard that somebody else has recommended it to her and thinks everybody ought to read this, but she hasn't got the time to read it herself. Um, Caroline Bingley. Uh, would join for the chance to patronise everybody else with uh, the latest book she's obviously purchased, but probably wouldn't have bothered to read it. But she can she can lord it over other people. Uh, Mr. Bennett would probably hide in his library if Mrs. Bennett held a book club, because Mrs. Bennett's book club, you know, is going to be all about gossip and nibbles and very little probably about the book itself, um, but just an ex excuse to get all her her cronies together. Mr. Wickham would uh, probably have read the book. Um, just uh, so he could talk about it knowledgeably as a way to flirt with you. Um, and uh, Catherine uh, Morland would be very enthusiastic about, about reading, but probably a little bit intimidated by anybody else who'd read a bit more extensively than her. Uh, and Mr. Darcy would like to talk seriously uh, about the book, would probably be twitted at every turn by Lizzie pulling his leg uh, if he got too serious. Uh, and Emma Woodhouse would naturally enough be the perfect person to match you with a suitable book. <laughs> or not or, or not, not. Or i not. mean this is the thing yeah um but i think she'd make a very good the 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 <laughs> emma woodhouse married would be an excellent hostess <laughs> yeah 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 no i i think the person i'd most like to be of all the jane austen characters i mean obviously lizzie it would be great fun and jane i think it would be great fun to be in a book club with them but they'd, they'd be a good balance wouldn't they I would imagine. yes Lizzie, Lizzie I would be being very sarcastic about some some books and jane would be saying no 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 really it's quite all right no it's, it's, look, there's some good points to it and so they'd, they'd sort of counterbalance each other i think i don't think fanny from mansfield park could be huge fun particularly if you read something which was full of sex and violence i think she'd find <laughs> a little bit sort of you'd be a bit, bit worried much. about about speaking up i think about it she might she sort of be quietly disapproving i don't know if she'd have yeah. much to say about it in case she offended somebody um but i think anne elliott would also make an excellent person i feel she's more you know my age as well i know she's <laughs> that old, but you know i feel that there would be a, an element of experience yes but she does go to sea so she's got lots of experience so i th and would have traveled the world so i would i think of all of them i'm going to choose anne elliott as my book club um member Yes, and possibly Eleanor of Marianne and Ele Eleanor fame is. Oh, of true. Name. Yeah. Uh, you can count on her for a bit of um, analytical and, and sensitivity and probably a balanced uh, head as well as heart. Uh, Actually, if we took thing. all the heroines, <laughs> put them in a yes, I mean, it would make an excellent book club because you've got the sort of the engine. You've got a lot to balance. That's what well. I love about Jane Austen, isn't it? Um, that no heroine is the same even in the same book um that they all have quite distinct characters and qualities and they all mm. go on little journeys uh you know that, that hopefully bring out the best of them uh, by the end of it but nobody's the same you can't say it's formulaic at all and that's what i love it's she's she's using all sorts of different 
female experiences. Um, uh, and that's why so many people, I think, uh, recognize themselves in Jane Austen, because it's not just one formulaic type of person, isn't it? Yes, yeah, so indeed. So I think in conclusion, what would Jane do about the book club? I think she would <laughs> love it. She would she absolutely would. love it. She'd be in and, there, queen of yeah. book club. <laughs> and the next time I go to my book club, I'm going to be thinking of her chuckling away in the corner, uh, watching us all, and then lampooning us in her next novel. Hopefully putting us in her next novel. Yeah. That, that was, I yeah. would definitely attend a book club just for that. So thanks very much, Kate. That was great fun. And uh, next month, let's hope we can find an, another um, topic to find what would Jane do. I'm going to start reading right now to get some ideas. Good. <laughs> Bye-bye, everybody. Happy reading. Happy reading. <laughs>